All right, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the grand finals of Singapore Debate Open 2018. Woo! Firstly, we would like to congratulate the teams that made it to the finals in opening government. We have Gong Chiao Si. Opening opposition, we have three Velociraptors. For the government, we have 3965 Malaya. And closing opposition, Pinus. Okay, I'll be your chair. My name is Patrick, formerly from UN. Judging alongside me from my left is Sharifra from Mara, Edwin from BAC, Jun Ming from SAF, and also Sarah in Oxford. Alright, a few house rules before we commence the debate. Please ensure that you keep your cheers, your jeers, your whatever conversations to a minimum. Please do not talk to the point that it will disrupt either the speeches or the judges. Please ensure that you just, you know, allow the debate to happen without making noise. Um, that being said, on the motion that reads, this house because the world where Nelson Mandela is remembered as a radical revolutionary rather than a peaceful reformist, I invite the Prime Minister. Here, here. Yeah, yeah. who suffered during the health of the I think being locked into different train cabins, being denied of eating spaces, being forced to drink in different places, requires an individual who stood up for them, who told them that breaking the law was necessary to fight against the discriminatory practices they were oppressing the very people who deserved their equal membership and belonging in the land they, they stood upon. We think that in an era in which laws were stacked against these very people, Nelson Mandela stood up as an individual who was willing to make those sacrifices necessary to see the changes on the ground. He was a visionary that was educated, that made him come from certain privileged backgrounds, but were willing to reach out to the lowest echelons of society to represent their beliefs and represent their struggle. He was willing to do extreme actions, like for example, like start protests, violent ones sometimes, to be yeah, able yeah. to jail, like, or to be able to lock up, or even secretly assassinate certain individuals. Yeah, These yeah. were the extreme stunts that he, as a leader, was willing to say were the necessary compromises and trade off because whatever we were suffering is far worse than any of that that we have done so far. And that the consequences to these individuals was brought about precisely because they failed to recognize as legitimate human beings that deserve to live peacefully uh, next to these other people who have positions of privilege. We think that it requires a rallying call that, that is representative of Nelson Mandela to tell individuals who are in similar situations that civil disobedience or like law-abiding practices of standing up against oppressors is insufficient. That sometimes we have to wage a war against the oppressors. That as a leader, like we were able to see different factions of, 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 of such rebel groups rally around one single individual believing in his philosophy of fighting against oppression. And we think that's a very good example. This is primarily effective and important for South Africa today because even in places like Johannesburg, we see that, that a lot of the struggles are still apparent on the ground. That people are still brutalized by individuals for casual sake, right? Because it's fun to be able to beat them up. That's why it's a crime field area that we feel unsafe to go in these places, right? Cape Town might be very privileged to be able to be free of such criminal presence, but we think that a lot of parts of South Africa is still right with a lot of such problems. We think that discrimination is not over yet, even in South Africa. Why is this that important? Why is this visionary image of a violent fight against the oppressor still relevant in South Africa? Because we think the ability to conceive of how he fight and those around him who would die for that cause, that bloodshed was necessary, will be able to understand that the tactics utilized by him were effective in the day to be able to reform the constitution, to be able to get a seat in parliament, to be able to shake the, the levers of power so that those things could still be fought today because the ability to forget that or your your willingness to forget that and leave that fight to the past allowing him to be seen as a, a person of peace 
means that the struggle is over and we want people to realize that it's not over just yet. But it's open, also important to understand that for the people who are the lowest, who suffer the most, must be able to see that he's an individual that's not just belonging to the elite class of individuals, despite his education background, despite his ability to converse in the language of the presser. Doesn't mean that he doesn't come to the bottom ground, right? He was willing to do what the farmers would do on the ground, to be able to fight their own fight as well. The ability to be able to connect to that, to that person or that representation tells them that every one of them in small units of fight is necessary and essential to collectively fight against a big thing. Why is this good in terms of our ability to see Nelson Mandela's fight in South Africa for the world? Because that's what the motion demands with us. Because there are a lot of fights in the world today that are exactly representative of what the, the people of South Africa went through back then. Why is it so? For example, if Aung San Suu Kyi's fight against the military junta, allowing her to be able to give, to give her concession to fight the brutality, instead of pulling back and saying that she should abide by the law, so instead of pulling back and saying that she's not respecting human rights right now, it means that we are able to allow her to prioritize the end conclusion rather than means of achieving that change. This means to say that we've deprioritized expectations of what are the rightful prerequisites to attain power. This means we legitimize violence. That means to say that in a case wherein someone needs to be killed, the political opposition that actually stands up, against, that stands for discrimination, needs to be assassinated. We give them the benefit of doubt. And this isn't just about the international community. It's about people on the ground stopping the rallies just because there's a sign of her delineating from what is rightful in the eyes of the people. Without this prejudice, we can then empathize the same fight, same guilt, and same pain of the people of South Africa that laid, that gave their lives out for Nelson Mandela's cause. But second, it's also important to understand that if we see the fight as a necessary means of revolution, we also see what were the aspects of that revolution and also shake up those institutions that were changing in South Africa. Why is it so? Because in the process of that violent fight, governments and institutions out there, private institutions even, were shaken because we were able to boycott them, hurt them, vandalize their property, steal and rob things from them. This means to say that if the, philo the political yeah, yeah. philosophy of violence is translated to other groups out there, we think that other government forces are then now able to preemptively make concessions to avoid the very same outcomes that would have been done by a group who follows the same philosophy. So given that he's a visionary and likely to be copycatted by people out there, we think that's a pretty good thing to do. But second, it's also understanding that death and sacrifice is necessary for retaliation against the powers of, of oppression. Why is it so that people need to understand that co the consequences that the law applies to you is irrelevant. They are willing to break it and go to jail for the sake of the cause. Closing. Assuming that people can relate to Nelson Mandela file fight, how about people that do not have Nelson Mandela will fight? I mean, if Rohingya choose to fight Aung San Suu Kyi, aren't they going to die? That? Then I mean, the thing is that they have to align themselves to the same cause, right? If they think that the cause is correct <coughs> and they would alleviate the suffering, then maybe that's the kind of route that you should as well. as well. But also to understand that death and sacrifice in the Nelson Mandela world was a way in which we could draw international attention, was the way in which we could actually change by allowing for bigger institutions, bigger powers out there to come into the assistance of South Africa to help them in terms of removing the certain legal restrictions that actually like shackled these people, to be able to take out the discriminatory practices in there. Lastly, it's also using this violence to connect to rebel groups out there. The Arab Spring showed to be a disaster, not because violence was bad, but because people, rebel groups didn't know what to do after the violence. If they were able to take reference to Nelson Mandela's uh, political philosophy, they would know that installation of technocrats is essential, there's an essential step immediately after a violent revolution. They will know that it's important to compromise and let go of certain leadership position to swear allegiance to a one single person that represents the right of people as well. All these things allow for our rebel groups out there that well, some people term them to be terrorists, but by and large, individuals who are freedom fighters, who are fighting against oppression, fighting for the same equal rights to be respected, will be able to take reference and have a better chance at political reforms in the areas that they belong. For this reason, Nelson Mandela should not be recognized in any other form but one of violence. Thank you. Alright, thank the Prime Minister for that speech. Leader of Opposition, please. Here, here. Woo!
we need to make violent revolution more seductive, says the government bench. But the logic of violent revolution has always been seductive. It is the story that the Palestinian Intifada follow. When they think that by putting themselves in harm's way in front of Israeli tanks and soldiers, by setting themselves as body bombs into Israeli camps, they will win. It is the same logic that the alt-right follows when they think. By showing our might, marching with tiki torches, somehow the country will bend to our will. Note that if you accept the logic of violence, you cannot control the number of groups who will choose to use it, and you cannot control the conditions with which it is effective. Mandela wasn't a terrorist. He was an incredibly talented politician who knew when to turn back from the brick. That's why he isn't remembered today for his terrorism, and we think he shouldn't. Many things in my speech, hopefully I'll have time for all of them, but you're out of The first thing I want to talk about is if violence is justified. I don't really want to die on this hill, but I just want to say some stuff on that. Two, I want to talk about the theory of political change and what actually works. Three, I want to talk about why radicalism and violence are less effective or actively counterproductive in the process of political change, a number of arguments under this. I probably won't have time to talk about South Africa and about radicalism um, as an idea, but maybe. Okay, first thing, um, is violence ever justified? I think the answer is possibly not, because violence means that you're willing to accept that you, are to, that, that you want to inflict harm or even death on other people, some of whom, many of whom in fact, might be innocent. It's quite easy for us to stand here as debaters and say, everyone is a collaborator. You've all you know, gotten some of that privilege that white people have. But the truth is, it's unclear whether that is in fact the case. Most people may, in their personal lives, even apart, people under the apartheid regime, been involved in acts of mercy or goodness towards their black neighbors. You don't know this, but you can't tell. You can never make that distinction. The truth is, violence is always likely to spiral out of control, and that is at least one reason why it might not be morally justifiable, or advocating it might not be morally justifiable. Yeah, yeah. The second thing is, what is the theory of political change we believe in? Because what is the truth of Nelson Mandela? The truth is, yes, the ANC of course participated in protests, sometimes violent ones, some acts of terrorism, some attempts to make the state ungovernable. But all of that didn't really work. The international community largely stood by. And it was really the negotiations under the table when the ANC was willing to abandon its terrorist facade and speak to people in the administration, speak to people like the clerk, and say, well, eventually public opinion in the world will turn and you will be isolated. And when that did happen, the clerk saw the logic of this and see the power. Note that every, almost every single sustainable political change that I can think of from an authoritarian or evil state changing to a democratic one has been peaceful. If you look at the examples of South Korea, the examples of Taiwan, these are not examples where people rose up against their oppressors and tried to fight them in open combat or guerrilla warfare, but are examples where people recognized that the way in which to do so was to speak um, to people in power, seek the right movement where someone would be willing to see power or share power, and then find the right opportunity to become elected or to win. We think that's a far more sustainable strategy. Why is that? Why does violence um, lead to a bunch of counterproductive things. And why, therefore, do we think that the message of peaceful reform, to the extent to which remembering Mandela, someone who everyone loves, is a peaceful reformer, is good and a good message we want to teach the rest of the world? Why is that the case? So, many things, I don't want to number them, but there are many at least eight. The first thing is that there is less backlash from the group of people who might be disenfranchised. Regardless of whether they're the majority or minority, obviously being willing to be violent against them will provoke a response from them. Two, there is less backlash from people within your community. Why is that? It's pretty simple. The logic of violence implies that as long as you're a member of my ally group, you must be willing to put your body in harm's way and to fight the good fight yeah, yeah. as Andre would have you believe. Many people are simply unwilling to do that. They might be less invested in you. They may know that they're living under the yoke of oppression, but not be personally willing or be faced under the moral obligation to fight. They will not support you. Three, it is unstable because it damages the trust in institutions and pot potential for peaceful change yeah, sure. that is important yeah. for anything lasting to be built. Four, it means that authorities fear ceding power because if yeah, you are violent yeah. towards them, they fear that when they lose, they will be killed. Therefore, they will fight harder. It tends to be the case that authorities yeah. and the people, the oppressors, have more <coughs> guns, so they are likely to win. But that is particularly important because if you think about it, Peace and peaceful actions trend democratic. They trend in the direction of justice. Because 
as long as there are more people of a particular group, they will over the long arc get more power. On the other hand, accepting violence is accepting a logic where you can use power at the barrel of a gun, then you can win. That means that people in power or people with more money to buy more guns are able to enforce that logic and win. It is incredibly unlikely for a small group yeah. to fight or render something, something ungovernable for long enough and win that battle. We think violence therefore is counterproductive and resigns your battles. You cannot win. Yes. In, in systems where you are locked up in political discourse, violence is the only means in which you can create bargaining power despite being a minority under the rule of your oppressors. So, First thing is presupposes that once you begin the cycle of violence, every single individual that is not as politically talented as Mandela will be able to rein it in. I think that is, history tells us that is, that is unlikely to be true. But secondly, I also dispute that this is the case. Because there are many ways in which you can protest or disobey peacefully and not radically and not violently and get this sort of change. But finally, it is, I, I think it is quite un, <coughs> untrue that people are locked out of political power in this fashion. But um, yeah, okay. What else can I say? Uh, but what else, why, why else is violence counterproductive? You lose support from allies because of the international norms they have about non-violence. Yeah, yeah. And finally, violence is likely to be captured by elites. To the extent to which they say that the logic of violent revolution is seductive, it is very simple and trivial for people to use easily deceived working class people as foot soldiers for their political goals. I think that is bad for the vast majority of people who claim to be struggling for independence and end up having their cause slaved under some bourgeois dictator, as we saw in several revolutions. Why do we think, not talking about South Africa, the idea of making radicalism associated with good causes is bad? Because if you say that Mandela was a radical revolutionary, what you're also saying is not just his ideas, that his methods were radical, but that his ideas were radical. But I think it is probably good to think about things like anti-racism and justice as not radical, but the norm that we should peacefully aim for and yeah, fight yeah. for. When Colin Kaepernick comes up to challenge the status quo, he is shunned because we think his idea is radical. At a point at which we think this is not radical, but an act like that can be part of peaceful reform and political discourse, we're far more likely to get good activism worldwide. Thank the Leader of Opposition for that speech. Deputy Prime Minister, please. Here, here. This also ignores most analysis that we talked about, that in places where you find it useful, this particular version of history means you galvanize people. It also means you give them example of how things can be done, not just now, but in the future, when in situations of post conflict. Yeah, yeah. But it also means that it tells you how exactly you can envision yourself in a different way than what your dictators or what your, what your particular governments and governments are going to I'm going to start by talking about my constructive mindedship because I think this bit makes a bit more sense leading to the buckets. And my contribution is this. Re believing or thinking of a situation in which this particular leader of Mandela was a peaceful reformist is bad for the world today of our conceptions of what are or are not legitimate forms or situations or legitimate forms of structures and systems to begin with. Saying he's a peaceful reformist suggests that the circumstances or the structures of the graph enable these sorts of reforms to happen in the first place 
enabled avenues to which peaceful reform could have happened, yeah. and it was great, it was great that he took them. But this fundamentally misunderstands the nature of these particular situations on the ground. If you accept that these particular types of oppressions or these particular types of dynasties are inherently wrong and inherently unjust, then you should also accept the reality on the ground that the only way they come into power and sustain their power is precisely by closing up those particular forms of change. And it's exactly for that that we must accept the truth of the matter that the only way this change was Mandela doing exactly the dirty, exactly the violent, exactly all those things that put a threat to these regimes. But on the back of it, suggests to the world and to our conception of rights at large that there is absolutely no way we can grant any form of legitimacy to them or these systems and think that there is a way for these individuals to get out. Because that's what we will use to say that when the dictator threatened us by, say, by saying, I'm going to gas these people, I'm not going to do anything. I'll draw a line in the sand. After you cross it, peace should be maintained. Let's maintain the sensitivities and the comforts that we have because perhaps there's something that could have done on the ground. Perhaps in any case, we are so comforted by this sense of peace and that somehow, some way, negotiation or some other form of peaceful mechanism can change or drastically shape the kinds of oppression or the kinds of rights that are lost on the ground. That's the point of Andre's speech. The way you can see these things, it's important to be lift the wolf because that's not the starting point of these revolutions. That's not the starting point of these oppressions that we conceive. Moving to rebuttals, that's exactly what we are starts with. The right that essentially is features of violence is bad. But as a starting point, we think the first thing that needs to happen is that we need to understand how these oppressions take place. They get into power because of the ability to say or to read a particular type of message to individuals that says you cannot think otherwise and you cannot challenge this. The more this message is, is, is sufficient, the less they're able to change or there's any interest in changing these, these things. That's why shaking these forms of systems, telling you that these things are racist in the first place, but you couldn't conceptualize anything but, is important to begin with. No, thank you. More than that, he then said, well, this is bad because you're going to, have, you're going to encourage backlash from the kinds of the, of, of the, of the disenfranchised and not. I'm not afraid to say that part of these particular types of revolutions or part of these types of actions require you to do things like silence even your own opposition members for the practical benefit of having a unified narrative as what that particular alternative conception should be. And that is exactly the kinds of things that need to be done. Further to this, Andre also told you that once you get the power to post conflict resolution in these particular things, also perhaps requires you to take the same kinds of actions. In Nongsa Suchi's case, we were shocked by the fact, no thank you, that they were that she was using the same kinds of the tactics that the Burmese government, the Burmese Richard used to use. But that shouldn't have been surprising. It should be an understanding that there was relativist to where the relativistic to where they were, were in the first place. Perhaps those are the kinds of systems and structures that we need to change as a conception of those particular things. And I think in those situations, you damage the trust in, 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 in those situations. It's exactly that we need to damage the trust of these institutions and exactly change narratives on the ground because that counters and it's antithetical to the concept of what these regimes or what these oppressive regimes did in the first place. It is no coincidence that many of these dictatorships or these regimes or oppressive structures, the first thing they do is change the history books, change the narrative for the heroes, change the kinds of individuals and where they came from, what they did, because it's exactly those stories that stand as galvanizing points and things to do in the first place. That was the bulk of Andre's speech that wasn't, wasn't amended to. If that is what dictators do, why are we pulling that wool over our, our eyes to continue adopting peaceful reform of his constructs of people who were fundamentally not afraid to do what was necessary in the first place. It is not a uh, coincidence as well that the majority of the important democracies in the world all went through important or long periods of strife and long periods of great amount of people to attain where they were. We shouldn't be afraid of this, and we think that changing the particular narrative to say he was a revolutionary, he was aggressive in those particular things, were all things that were necessary. Before I carry on, anybody? Because I've lost my timing. Okay. Yeah, I'll uh, close isn't that evil principally to burden the most vulnerable and the most oppressed to carry out their own way? Sorry, sorry, sorry. Isn't that principally evil to burden the most oppressed to carry out all of their suffering yeah, yeah. by themselves oh. and not by the help of the privileged? Yes, it is. And, it's, and the reason why it is is because that particular structure made it oppressive to begin with. And that's why if we don't reconceptualize what these structures are, we continue to think that we operate within the same system of democracy where you had that particular opportunity and we are burdening you because the state had that opportunity, had that burden to begin with. But conceptually, this is disingenuous because that burden on the state isn't the burden or isn't the structure that we've, well, we've, we've seen in the first place. That's why changing the narrative is so important to our approach, both in terms of history, when we study these things, and in terms of policy and adopting approaches to these particular instances as well. Jan says, well, well, then we will lose our proper negotiations where things handed under the table. I accept. 
but the functionalities of these wars, the functionalities of violence, the practicalities don't change. Negotiations are still part of wars, bartering for bigger things are still part of wars that can still happen. The difference is, if you go to a table to negotiate or barter a hand to underhand thing, you need to bring something to the table. If it has to be a gun, it has to be a gun. And in those circumstances, it is exactly what these regimes are hoping you don't do. They always say, I'm ready to go, let's go. But you're, and you're, are you ready to die? And the response has to be yes. And that's exactly the kind of thing that we need to promote in saying that people should be willing to do. Because that's the only way we make change. Past that, we should also move ourselves from a situation that we're comfortable with this peace and say that all these revolutionaries who did difficult things did it peacefully. That's how we change the world, that's why we propose. Thank the Deputy Prime Minister for that speech. Deputy Leader of Opposition, please. Here, here. Mr. Speaker and members of the panel, the greatest legacy that Nelson Mandela left us is the ability to advocate in his name, his ability to run movements using him as the face of that particular movement in order to drive change. This debate should be adjudicated on the metrics as to how we enable today's reforms using Nelson Mandela as the face of that movement. That's what my case is going to be, I'm going to extend on that. Before that, let me deal with a few things that came out specifically from Brian's speech. The first thing he tells us is that Galvanization can only happen when you have violence to violence to provide to people that they galvanize on on the premise of violence against the oppressors. I don't think that's true because gal good causes are necessary galvanizing in nature. If people galvanize around facts, they need to reform their current state of livelihood. What violence what violence does for you and why you galvanize on like actions of radical reform is you just galvanize on bad methods to enable that change. What that means is that you often lose the ability to stand on the moral high ground of principles in order to drive that particular change, where other people are unwilling to support you and galvanize with you in that instance. But more importantly, it, pro it basically prolongs the conflict and actually provides, actually, actually just proves counterproductive in nature, right? Because at the point of time where the whole US American Congress was galvanized by the seduction of violence under the Bush regime, Regime, what it did was leave Iran and Iraq in a much worse state than what we see today. Because the advent of democracy was already galvanizing, just the methods of violence were bad. We think that that's something that opposition doesn't stand on today. The second thing that they tell us is that we need to provide alternatives to that. I think many of them exist. The Indian partition and the Indian fight against British movement so. happened with the advent of civil disobedience led by Mahatma Gandhi, that you can actually take civil disobedience and disobey laws in a non-violent method so. they can't actually jail you for it or they can't actually take up arms against you because today's international norms in today's day and age means that overall countries across the world decry violence in terms of anywhere it happens. What that means is they're more likely to support you and more likely to decry the oppressors when they do take up arms against you because they often will when you have a certain political, political agenda against them. Because at the point of time where you're seen as radical, it's not a natural progression of political change that you're undertaking, but some, uh, but something that's super radical and super different from today's norms. Right. The next thing, the next thing we tell us is South Africa. They say South Africa needs to galvanize Nelson Mandela's image as a radical reformist. Right. We tell you that's not true. Because in today's South Africa, we see a strong undercurrent of white people across South Africa believing that black crimes are severe and more importantly, anti-national in that country. But more importantly, a violent narrative around Mandela means that you then legitimize this opinion that these people hold. In terms of that, the governance structures today have been illegitimately acquired by the people within that particular nation. We think that's particularly bad when you paint Nelson Mandela in that light. We think peaceful reform and natural progression of political process 
process as Nelson Mandela's guiding light and guiding philosophy means that you legitimize what happens today in South Africa in terms of governance structures and are more able to change on the ground battles that we face today in South Africa. We think the die on that hill of South Africa, but yes. Um, if we change what structures were illegitimate in the first place. Sorry, sorry, can you start again? What if we change structures that were illegitimate in the first place? How is some level of comfort in, in the structure that works a best a worse thing? Comfort? I'll tell you why. Because at the point of time, you paint the structure, and the paint the change in that structure is something radical and something a huge deviation away from where you stand on today. You let people who are in charge of the structure are likely to think that it should not change. When you paint it as the fact, it's just a reform, a natural progression of political process. It's more likely to change because people now believe that all these things, such as black rights and so on and so forth, are a natural progression that we need to lead to. We do not want to think that it's anti current norm and anti-traditional to change in today's society. What did Jan tell you firstly? Right. Jan told you in a world where reward is intrinsically tied to the method that method that dictates your actions, etc., the world already believes in that, Mr. Speaker, that the actions you take obviously mean the obviously result in the reward you get. We don't want to set an example to current leaders of independence movements, Sir. black lives movement, that you will get power and be loved for being reactionary and taking up arms against the state. What we instead want is people like Colin Kaepernick to have been endorsed by Nike at the end of a peaceful struggle against white oppression within that particular nation. But more importantly, in a world where Nelson Mandela is seen as a radical revolutionary, any changes to the traditional norms of society and any movements advocating in his name are seen as radical and huge deviations away from what is accepted. That these ideas are revolutionary and not natural, non natural evolutions of a political process. That means the consequence of that is they're less likely to be accepted by anybody who is in power. What that means importantly is that under our side, these movements and the causes underpinning these movements are seen as necessary fragments of any daily political process that we lead through. So decades and decades of change is seen as natural progression and organic change that leads to that process because it is not seen as radical and transformatory and antithetical to the current constitution. And that is particularly important, right? Because what Nelson Mandela advocated is human rights are a natural thing that people should have, not a radical idea that we all need to believe in. That's why you want a peaceful reform and not paint his only and not paint his ideas as radical because what is often construed and misconstrued by people in perception is when the so, methods are radical the ideas are obviously radical yeah, that yeah. is the tie that we need to break within today's political change because at the point of time where people believe the ideas were radical we do not get any change i have many things to talk about sit down the next thing that Jan says are many things in which he doesn't number them so i'm going to number them first thing he says is that say First, movements don't face backlash from oppressors who oppress or from the people who sympathize but are part of the oppressing populace in general. But secondly, they convince the oppressor that they won't die or suffer, suffer extremely if they see power. They, they, they believe that even if they see power and see some changes or compromises, they would be able to live naturally because it's a peaceful trans transformation into another process. But thirdly, it tells movements that grievances can be channeled in ways that don't need violent clashing communities to get success. What it drives in terms of success is that different ideological notions can be resolved from both inside and outside the system yeah, that yeah. currently exists in a peaceful process. Fourthly, and very importantly, is that people in these movements don't need to risk their livelihood and bodies to achieve change. That success does happen in spite of you putting your body at the line. That success is a possibility that happens in a peaceful environment. That, that icons like Gandhi and icons like Mandela are seen as identities of peaceful reform in today's world. And lastly, allies that, don't are, that are necessarily part of the community are more willing to risk going to like large media houses and talking publicly about your oppression when they know that they won't be killed or won't suffer for these things. In the idea that you have a radical reform, our allies are also at risk. That means you have lesser and lesser number of people fighting for your cause. We can't stand for any of that. I thank the deputy leader for the opposition. Now to begin the closing half, member of government. Here, here. Yeah, yeah.
Okay, yeah. Over the years, we have very insidiously changed the narrative behind the word radical from something is, that is perfectly a rational response from oppressed communities to something that is stigmatized as inherently bad. This is part, and this is true, of part of a global conspiracy to continue the oppression of minorities uh, by keeping them peaceful, by keeping them demanding reform through peaceful means. All change that has happened in the world has been inorganic, inherently inorganic. Yeah, yeah. It is through various nuanced contributions of radical movements that peaceful reformists have had the capital to be able to do, conduct the reform or the peaceful reform that they've been able to conduct. Now, this debate is obviously primarily about South Africa, right? Because the vast majority of people who look up to Nelson Mandela are South Africans. And what we're gonna talk about in this debate primarily is why the ANC has politically been able to immunize themselves from criticism by playing the peaceful Nelson Mandela card while South Africans or black South Africans continue to suffer. So let's talk about South Africa. White wealth has continued to beget white wealth. They own the vast majority of farms in a largely agricultural country. Black South Africans, 20 years after apartheid, continue to live in some make up most of the largest slums in the world, if, after all this time, right? And this is largely because South Africans continue to be trapped in a cycle of exclusion from the political process that opening government claims is supposed to give them organic change, supposed to get them more rights. Even though you have black politician now, what does that matter? What does that mean anything for the vast majority of black South Africans who still live in a state of apathy. It's just that the walls are now wealth. It's the walls between a gated community and the slums and the very large slums that they live in right now. So post apathy there's been a general sentiment that equality has been achieved and that's what the ANC continues to propagate because Nelson Mandela got them that equality through peaceful reforms. So how does change theory through radi uh, happen through radical uh, revolution, right? Because Nelson Mandela, firstly, was able to become an effective, peaceful reformist because he started as a radical revolutionary. It is inextricably linked. Why is this so? He started off by burning flags, being part of riots, involved in car bombings, that was part of the movement that got so much of attention, that gave Nelson Mandela so much attention, right? Which is why when he went to prison, and as a martyr, the letters that he wrote became a lot more impactful. That the reason why people read these letters and he was an important human being that they wanted to look up to and he got the attention that he got was because that radical revolution was inextricably linked to his ability to become a peaceful reformist himself or to actually reform the system. So I find it absolutely strange to not tell people how he started fighting for black rights and how black rights was actually achieved. Where did it start? So I think radical revolution has to be the main thing that people talk about when it comes to giving oppressed minorities the motivation to do something about their oppression, right? Additionally, I think what also happens is Nelson Mandela was able to shift the overturn window on what is an acceptable political narrative, right? Because what we often see is around the world, various oppressive governments are constantly championing peaceful reform. Like, yeah guys, protest, go ahead, MLK was great, we have MLK Remembrance Day. But at the same time, they don't talk about Malcolm X. They don't talk about the fact that both of them operating in the same system allow independent... Yeah, sorry, sorry, Malcolm X theory. Uh, both of them operating in the same system allowed, in, allowed the general sentiment to mean that black people had to be more assertive in demanding their rights, right? That, they, that, um, that, that there's a middle point somewhere that we can't always be peaceful in terms of how we demand our rights and that, it's, that being assertive means you're likely to achieve more things and some of your demands are likely to become a bit more acceptable. 
And I think what's key about this is that this forces people to negotiate, right? Because Yan is sort of right. He sort of says that if you bring guns um, to a fight, then the other guy is also going to bring guns. He often has bigger guns. But what, this, what, what you don't realize is that you have to bring those guns because at any point in time, the other guy with the big guns also does not want to die. You have to push him to create or give in to some, make some concessions, to give in to some demands. And that's how Nelson Mandela got a lot of the change that he got as well. Yeah, like yeah. you have to get them to negotiate and that often involves bringing guns even if they have bigger guns in that world, right? So I'm gonna further extend, no, thank you, about why there is a principal justification to radical revolution as well. There are three reasons why. Because A, the focus on peace often trivializes the suffering of the disenfranchised, right? The kind of atrocities committed against black people, South Africans, um, over the years um, has been really grievous, right? So we should not be shy to admit that radical revolution is okay. Because if you think about it, after like 400 years of slavery, decades of Jim Crow, decades of segregation, decades of police brutality, it's not seductive to be violent, it's perfectly rational to be violent, right? And I think at that point in time, even if violence often means that there is collateral, that collateral is justified, right? Why do I say so? Because at the point which you're an oppressed community, you go to war. When you go to war, sometimes you end up hurting people within your community as well. But often wars involve collateral. That's why the Palestinians, although are very justified in the fight that they have against the oppression by the Israeli state, often have casualties for Palestinians as well. I think this doesn't take away from the fact that their violence is justified. Additionally, there's no other meaningful mediums to oppose that, right? Democracy in South Africa is hard because white South Africans control capital and the economic destiny of the country to the extent that black people are excluded from the democratic process. African Americans in the United States are sequestered from genuine representation yeah, through yeah. things like gerrymandering or the binary political options that they have in those countries. If there's no other meaningful mediums to demand change, then I think that radical revolution is inherently justified, right? Additionally, I think the narrative of peace is what has made these political institutions, especially the ANC, that has often played the Nelson Mandela card impervious to criticism, right? Because what they say is that peaceful reform is the only way to achieve change. Look what Nelson Mandela did when they have not been giving any reforms to black people in South Africa. And I think this is what governments around the world often propagandize, right? Through peaceful reform, remembering MLK and not Malcolm X. And the key thing to remember here is that, again, every social movement has had a radical past that is inextricably linked to the kind of progress that they've achieved in status quo. But none are remembered. And I think that's highly disingenuous. I think we have to tell them where the starting point is. And the starting point is radical revolution. Right, thank the member of government for that speech. Member of all, please, here, here. <laughs> you that this debate should happen in the context of South Africa and we will engage uh, on CG on that. We will show you why the radical revolution that they want, uh, why the radical belief in and of itself will bring harm to the people of South Africa, but even more than that, we will show you why radical revolution doesn't happen in the South African context. But first of all, I think that this debate shouldn't be about movements, right? Why? Because first of all, different struggles requires different methods. That's why black or poor movement in US and in France or UK or even in South Africa are different and takes different forms because reasons are different. So that's so we don't understand why suddenly one person like Nelson Mandela can can override the 
those differences and suddenly uh, change the method to so everyone be violent, right? We think it's unlikely. But then secondly, understand that different struggle have different leaders. This means that you have different form of inspiration and different person as inspiration. That's why in Indo feminists in Indonesia believe like use Hadija as their main leader and main inspiration because it resonates with the majority Muslim. Comparatively in US people like Sheryl Sandberg more because this because it resonates with people who are mostly working class in the American society. That's why this is not about movement. This is about context of South Africa and how South African people should be protected better. But then let's engage the OG first because they want inspiration due to violence. First of all, we don't understand, right? Because people who disenfranchise will stand up anyway. It's their survival instinct. That's why you have Black Panther Party in the USA, even though they uh, like and they make their own um, leader who is Malcolm X because because there is their survival instinct to be uh, to fight back in a radical way, right? So we think that the only reason most people don't do violent things is because they thought it is not dangerous or not fruitful. That's why people in North Korea doesn't rebel because they think it will harm their safety and they will. And secondly, they think there is no way to success. And this is not because they have no inspiration, right? It's just because uh, it's just because the condition doesn't allow them to do so. This means their case is first of all not inherent emotion, second of all doesn't happen, and third of all very evil, as Pandu has pointed that to like shift the standard towards these people. Then this debate should talk about, first of all, the people who are directly affected, no thank you, uh, by Nelson Mandela, which are the South Africans, and secondly, people who are not that disenfranchised, like South African society, right? We think for them, the best reparation is non-oppressive government. So we're gonna talk about how political system after will be better under our side of the house. First of all, we think that uh, if CEO wants to do change with revolution, we think it's impossible. Because first of all, take a context of uh, South Africa. Most people there are divided, which means there are black people who are against white people, there are black people who likes white people, there are black, there are white people who likes white people. So like everyone has their own belief, right? This means more likely the number that you get that people who are like highly against black people, highly against white, white people is a very, very small number. But secondly, in the context of Africa, these people has gone through civil war, has gone through civil war, has gone through poverty, and they're developing countries. So we don't think that most of the society will want, a, uh, like even the most disenfranchised one, will want a radical revolution. Understanding that they are the understanding that they know how it feels to not have infrastructure, and understanding that they they want the infrastructure happening in their country to be better, and those will be deterred by war. But let's assume their best case that suddenly um, the like pe these people like radical revolution. We think it is very, very dangerous. Why? First of all, let's analyze who is Nelson to these people. Their, their hero, their founding father. This means, A, they, they will justify all of his values and it becomes the standard of what is good, but B, it, they, they hold dear and practice their val uh, the value of Nelson Mandela very, very, um, very, very closely. What will they do if they remember Nelson Mandela as, uh, as radical? A, we think that these people will feel, pro even they know that they cannot rebel, but they only feel protected by violent leader because they think that other forms of leader is weak and not going against the course of the country because Nelson Mandela um, win this country by doing violent revolution, right? So this means that you will vote for most likely radical parties and this demand create a competition where politics become uh, who is more radical or who is more protectionist, who is more like Trump, right? We think this is very, very dangerous. And the first set of the house, too, maybe INC just certain degree of corruption, but we think that the shield that prevents them from doing more harmful things is the, exactly the shield of being peaceful. Because the because the only reason they're still um, no thank you because they, because they understand that my strong point is that I'm saying to people I'm like Nelson Mandela and I believe in peace. Therefore, they will not do things like shut down opposition or being too protectionist or being too harsh to other country that might build that might build good uh, relationship with South Africa and it's necessary because they will think that because people then will think that this is not going to a true this is not getting their promise this is not peaceful and this is not what ANC should be right so even if uh, it's ANC is not perfect on the side of the house but it's at least a bare minimum of of like peaceful because it's their shield but no thank uh, no thank you but secondly even if people can rebel against the violent party, we think it's very bad uh, because understand that it's only happened, it's going to happen in a violent way and more likely the government uh, will only close up and do it also more violently like Maduro in Venezuela or Qadhafi in Arab Spring, right? So we don't want that under our side of the house before that uh, opening. So the Nelson Mandela's radical story gives people at least a guide to when violence should be invoked and the, the governance tactics post-violence. 
So some people it's organically a, a knowledge for them, but for those, a reference point is always good, no? Okay, first of all, we don't understand why this reference point is a reference point because a reference point has to be able to be referred by a lot of people. Yeah. And we told you that this that this kind of, like every struggle has every, different circumstances. So we think that the argument of reference point is not actually important at all in this debate. But then why the aftermath of building this country is better under side of the house? Because under our side of the house, you have a united, uh, because in building a country, you need a united and aligned agenda. Exactly, because most likely uh, you are like war torn and you need, you lack money, so some people might be poor. On the other side of the house, these poor people, like in South Africa, they will take arms, they will go against the government because they feel I am disenfranchised and I'm following Nelson Mandela. We think this is very harmful because then, even if the, because then you divert the focus to them, which means that you don't get enough focus for things like infrastructure building, which could be useful for these people also. So under their side of the house, you uh, even like so you incentivize people to rebel and understanding that there are still a lot of poor people, you will you, like the moment they think something is not justified, they will take up arms and do the fine things. While it might be harmful to their own good and to the building of the government. Why is this particularly true in Africa? Because first of all, a lot of them are still poor. They're still living in uh, they're still living in township because they're in developing country. But second of all, the disparity between white and black is high. Well, we already show you in un under our side of the house. This people will be bad, will be good at, at like there's a bare minimum level of ANC but under their side of the house you only get violent revolution they never told you how the government will be established under them they never told you the aftermath of this violence like for all those reasons very proud to oppose thank the member of opposition for that speech government whip please here here <laughs> Extreme 
violence is happening now, do I capitulate to the violence or do I ensure that I am more safe by negotiating the person who seems more moderate? The only way that moderates are able to be seen as moderate is if there is someone who is more extreme pushing the limits of acceptability for them. That is why it is not as opening opposition preposterously suggests that the idea of equality is now a radical concept, but rather to these individuals who don't think that racism currently exists, it is a radical concept and you need to tell them there's something that is more radical out there for them to be able to see that they probably should negotiate because it's actually moderate to believe that some people deserve it. Right. No. But I think Theo is also correct in pointing out that at the end of the day, um, it is probably true that now Mandela, while being able to make some changes in the global sphere, oftentimes the figures that are the most relevant to individuals are the figures who are the most proximate to the country that we are talking about. So to the extent to which I think the opening exchange is somewhat speculative with regards to whether or not Mandela's specific legacy is able to radically change the way we perceive revolution, I think that it is definitely true that the way that we perceive Mandela has significant impacts on South Africa and the way that the South African community and people look at their own government. So why exactly is the ANC incredibly problematic? We think, oh thank you, the ANC has consistently used the symbol of Mandela as being a shield towards criticism that can exist even though they are currently rife with corruption and no longer uphold the spirit of the ANC that Nelson Mandela stood for. Unfortunately, they use that shield and say that radical revolution uh, and that radical revolutions were wrong because ultimately negotiations and peaceful critique and simply speaking to your government is sufficient for you to create changes even though the vast majority of the disenfranchised black majority within South Africa have still not gotten any rights to them. What the ANC has instead done is to give some tokenistic affirmative action quotas to the already most privileged elite <coughs> of the blacks, uh, the blacks in South Africa and, say, and use the fact that Nelson Mandela fought for the equality and said, look what peaceful revolution gives you. That is why the roads must fall, for example, or the campaign for free education within South Africa was so violently clamped down by the government for the specific reason that they said that this is not the way to change, they should instead use Point. other channels yeah. to be able to get that change opening. Part of your case seems to suggest the radical revolution is good and people need to learn it. The other part suggests the radical revolution is the means to criticize the ANC. Which one is it? Sorry, is the means to what? Criticize the ANC. Which is one? Which one is it? Yeah, it's, it's precisely the same. So radical yeah, revolution yeah. is good, therefore you need to have to think revolu radical revolution is good and not think that peaceful is wrong the way to go in order to criticize the ANC. Because the ANC is currently using the banner of Nelson Mandela and his peaceful reform to be able to say that any radical revolution that currently exists in South Africa is something that's illegitimate. I don't understand why those two things are contradictory. All right, um, the next thing is, we think that the current ANC has basically capitulated to the trappings of power. So what they have done is that they have siphoned, literally some of the things that they have done is siphoned money from the poorest black communities in order to continue to buttress their own spheres of influence and the amount of support that they have. But the people within South, South Africa are incapable of being able to rise up against that specific government because it is easy to silence them and change the minds of perhaps the more moderate individuals who are not as tied to that movement by saying that the radical revolution was something that was wrong and not something that Mandela would have supported. We think a narrative in which Mandela was a radical revolutionary changes this in a, in a, in a, in a number of ways. Firstly, I think it is wrong for Seo to suggest that the, what happens now is that they think that the ANC is justified the violence against these people. Because the entire point of Mandela's resistance was to say that violence from your government is never justified and that the ability to use the levers of power and the privilege that you possess to oppress and like ignore and disenfranchise the entire community is something that deserves an equally violent reaction. So therefore, as a result, we think the ANC can no longer use this particular narrative in order to shut down any sort of critique against them because the people on the ground who look up and look up to Mandela are now able to rationalize that a violent re revolution on that ground would be much better with regards to their ability to critique that particular ANC. The important clarification that we need to make is this, that it is probably true that neither position with, with regards to peaceful reform or radical revolution is something that necessarily is able to get a 100% of the outcome. But what we suggest the two must work together. But in a world in which the ANC can use the idea that radical revolutions are completely not acceptable in society, that this allows the people of South Africa to either firstly be able to critique them, critique them in a more meaningful manner, but secondly also restricts the ability of them to garner the kind of support that is necessary to overthrow a corrupt government. We're happy to propose.
the government for that speech. Opposition wave. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Opposing governments want the people with power to negotiate with the poor. But they never really explain to you that you have to understand in order for you to negotiate, the rich is to feel that they are attracted. But all of their characterization tell us that South Africans is incredibly poor, that they are weak in numbers, that they are, for example, do not have the capital to do that. Then why the hell the government willingly will negotiate with them? Isn't that easier to just shut them down and shoot them all and kill them and they won't do shit because they cannot do anything? I think the outcome should be the burden of all government benches that try to justify the violence. Because if you justify violence and yet you just go there to do to kill that, there's just suicidal. But unfortunately, open opposition do not talk anything about South Africans, right? They only mention South Africans. Closing opposition will bring you the context of Africans in this debate, right? Firstly, then, why then closing opposition should win this debate? Because I'm pretty sure opening half is not. Because simply they talk about we should uh, revolutionize people to bring up their arms and. and you inspired by Nelson Mandela. I think Nelson Mandela is a specific one that relates most to Africans. Fiji told you there are many other figures that should not be counted in this debate, right? But then, how then this radical, second issue, how then this radical revolutionary, remember Nelson Mandela, will harm South Africans? Because closing government told us that now the ANC party used Nelson Mandela as a justification from all criticism, right? But here's the thing. There is no difference at all also under the death of the house. Because under the death of the house, assuming that Nelson Mandela gained the independence, but remember as the revolutionary, uh, radical revolutionary figure, then the ANC will also build its identity based on Nelson Mandela who gave them independence, ladies and gentlemen. So it's about the comparisons on which kind of oppressions that is less violence to the most poor. We say that building an ANC under the name of radical revolutionary Nelson Mandela is far worse comparisons. Why is that the case? They told you that they want people to bring more arms. But Fiji told you that in the early in her speech that okay, the people will demand to a political party that is more violent because that is what in line with Nelson Mandela uh, spirit. And understand in the early independence day of South Africa, more likely these are the things that people will demand. Right? So what does it mean? It means under their South Dust, number one, ANC will still be in power and ANC will still be uh, you know, will still yeah. idolize Nelson Mandela anyway. And it is possible, right? Because precisely it's his figure and it's their hero and they're the one who bring them independence. But second, Fiji told you, right? It ends in grand, uh, so people will grant the ANC power. What will ANC do, right? They will more likely be able to sh create a more authoritarian government and in context of South Africa during after, after their independence, this is completely possible because they are, they are poor because they were disenfranchised by apartheid, they are less educated because of the they are the victim of apartheid. So that means under the death of the house, you will allow these governments to rise to power without any control from the society at the first place, ladies and gentlemen. Second, during those process of ANC and from the past till today, what will they do, right? Of course, as we both can see, both governments, uh, both ANC are probably sucks and in doing their jobs, right? But under their side of the house, we will still be able to justify their suffering by ANC saying to their society that this is us fighting against imperialism. This is what a lot of authoritarian and charismatic leaders do. Like this is what Sukarno do in the 60s and 264, for example. <laughs> Even though Indonesia was at the poorest level at the time, but Sukarno said that this is our fight against imperialism. All of this rhetoric will be uh, like will be done to justify the suffering of the people, ladies and gentlemen, and justify all the costs, uh, all of the South Africans, right? And that is incredibly bad. But secondly, uh, but thirdly, understand uh, that under the death of the house, you will shut down opposition's movement. So chairman came up and said that violent movements are shut down because the government said that it is not in line with an ANC value of peaceful. Well, under your side of the house, those violent movements will be shut down by gun directly, right? Because now the government are so authoritarian, that means like you do not necessarily have to, like I just have to shut it down because simply I have the power. And that is incredibly harmful because people under your side of the house will be dead with no result at all. Under our side of the house, the likelihood of the government willing to listen to this violent movement, the, uh, the road must fall down movement, is likely to be bigger to negotiate. Why is that the case? Because Fiji told you that this government has the responsibility to carry on 
peaceful name of Nelson Mandela. So they cannot just shut them down with gun. They will have to cater them and probably start to ask them what is wrong with you and why do you do this movement simply. And that can only happen because they carry out the peaceful man, the peaceful name of Nelson Mandela. So opposition criticism will more likely be listened under Arsha of the House because you cannot shut them down with violence. You can shut them down with negotiation. Negotiation happen better under Arsha of the House, right? But even if under Arsha of the House, the society are truly inspired by Nelson Mandela and they're willing to bring up gun and do violent revolutions, we say that this is incredibly harmful because these are the things that all government base trying to justify. But this is incredibly bad because they never really show the likelihood as to why these revolutions will be successful. And understand that revolutions require lives. Thousands of people will be dead, shut down by the society and shut down the police and by the army. Why then the unlikely possibility of getting that is justified to uh, justify to you know to justify your fire revolution thing is pretty unclear. We stand up by the life of the people and that's what should be defended in closing opposition that is angry especially in the context of South Africa when people do not have the ability to carry out gun helicopters and all of the things that the government have, ladies and gentlemen. That is why it is abhorrent. Before I move on, closing. So it's not just about trying to make them more violent, right? It's also trying to make them more assertive in how they demand their rights. So shifting the Overton window. And instead of just passively voting all the time. The majority of South Africans are black. Do you think this is enough critical mass? All right. I extensions, our material just shows you as to what under their south of the house with the revolutionary radical Nelson Mandela figure, ANC will be more likely an authoritarian party that able to build its party based on violent and radical belief. And that's bring the ability of this party to shut down all of those movements even under their south of the house. I think they should listen more carefully. Under our south of the house, why things is going to get better, right? We see told you that the, this is why neutral and peaceful Mandela is better. Because first of all, the political party carry out its name. So that, what does it mean? It means that number one, if you even though under our side you're corrupt, even though under our side you do all of that bad things, at least under our side of the house, you cannot kill your opposition, you cannot shut them down because that will be backlash to all of the shit that you're doing this time. But second, I think progress existing in status quo because society start to get fed up with all of the corruptions that ANC do. Under our side of the house, however, it's better because now our opposition alternative are not shut, can be easily shut done by government, they can run the criticism. I don't know what will happen in the future, but at least under our South Dallas, the only thing that incentivizes them to listen and negotiate is the peaceful name of Nelson Mandela. Because that's the shield that they use, that's the burden that they carry, and that's why the people of South Africa are only better if you if you make the ruling governments willing to listen by peaceful means. We are very proud of those things.